It's time, it's finally time, to take these botanical print scarves and over-dye them with the indigo. My little makeshift studio on the side of the house is it's quite a hodgepodge of things. I've got remnants of the botanical prints. And this fairly nasty looking bucket sitting here, that's the henna and the bananas that have been simmering. That's what I'm going to use to start my indigo vat and the leaves and the walnut dye, and that's just resting for now. But now it's time to get the indigo back going. I've got my five gallon stainless steel container here filled with water, and then it's brown because that's the henna and the banana juice that's been strained off, and that's what's going to help start the vat. And this is my precious jar of indigo pigment. This, this is the paste that took months of growing and then doing the extraction process and letting it all precipitate down and getting it into smaller and smaller quantities to where I have just this sort of half quart of really thick, beautiful indigo paste that's the heart of the vat. And that's, that's what we've all been waiting for. And it's, it's going to be a glorious thing. So there's three parts to an indigo vat. There's the indigo, of course, the most important thing, but there's the sugar or something that's going to eat up the oxygen in the water. And then there's lime uh, or something that's going to raise the pH of the vat. And in this case, this is it's called hydrated lime or garden lime. It's also pickling lime, but that's what I'm using to raise the pH of the, the liquid. And for now, I'm wanting the, the pH to be pretty high. I'm wanting it to be up around 11, and I'm going to start with uh, dyeing the, um, the linen scarves, which can handle that, that high pH. I need to heat it back up a little bit and get everything to get everything up to about 120 degrees, and then just balance it all out, make sure I've got the sugars are eating up the oxygen and that the lime is getting the pH up as high as I need it to be. So this is after about an hour. It's, it got to 120 degrees and then I let it rest for a bit. And it's, you know, it's not quite there. It, the color is not quite right. The, um, it should be getting a little bit of a, a metallic sheen on top. You can see that little cluster of foam that's called the flower and then all of that foam, but you see the pH is just at 9.6, and so I really, I need to add a bit more lime to get it going. And then there's not that metallic sheen, which means that the oxygen has been reduced. So I'll add a bit more lime and stir it up, and always stir, trying not to add any oxygen to the, to the liquid, and being very careful and just using that centrifugal motion. And then once it's all kind of stirred up, then come back gently and stop the, stop the centrifugal motion and then let it rest for a bit longer. And then I'll ch come back in a bit and check. Still got a little ways to go here. And you can see there's a little bit of that metallic sheen starting to come, but this still means that I need to adjust the vat a little bit. And that just takes time and practice learning how to do that. So I added some more sugar in the form of fructose, and I also added some more lime to get the pH higher. And my efforts have been rewarded. I've got that nice metallic sheen. And so here you can see that little coppery sheen, and then the water underneath is kind of a tea color, which is what we want. And so I'm going to let this rest another day and come back to it the next day. And it's a chilly morning. And now it's time to see, look at, you know, what I'm wanting to do with the over dye. You know, the scarves, they look, they look pretty nice, you know, but I just, I, I really like the idea of over dyeing the botanical prints with the indigo. That's kind of my thing, I guess. And so I just, I really want to give them that more unique look. And as I said, I'm going to start with the linen scarves because I've got the pH pretty high in the, in the vat. And there's, um, there's a little bit of the marigold left on the linen, 
but that's what I'm going to do now is uh, sort through everything and just and start with the linen. The silk will have to wait because I have to lower the pH of the vat for the silk uh, because the high pH just kind of destroys the, the fabric. It eats it up. But starting with the linen, I'm going to do what looks like tie-dye and so but and has actually gotten the the nicer name of um, Japanese technique that's called shibori. It's a uh, resist technique and so using it's uh, creating ways to block the dye from getting onto the fabric and using mechanical means like rubber bands or I've got some wood little wood blocks that I use some um, plastic uh, you'll see these uh, plastic sheeting and it's just it's all these different ways to and it creates patterns and keep but it basically it's ways to keep the indigo from dyeing sections of the fabric and you know I don't really have any plans for each of these each one I just I look for places on the uh, the botanical prints that look interesting and where I think that would be nice just to leave it be and then the lighter areas especially I want to have those take up the indigo but some of the darker areas and some of the areas that have more interesting prints I want to protect from the indigo and and have them look um, just so that, you know that's you can see some of those deep nice details that came from the um, from the botanical prints so that's one down and then I'm going to show you one other one um, just with the um, again with the linen but this one I'm going to use kind of a combination of the, the resist te techniques I'm going to use on this one I'm going to do kind of an accordion pleating thing and then I'm going to use these um, little wooden blocks to and clamp those on there and I've got um, there's these uh, yeah so oh, here you can see this is a it was a nice little plant or nice little leaf print so I wanted to protect that and so I've got those little wooden blocks and then I use, um, I think they're called bulldog clamps that I clamp onto the, um, the fabric and hold, that holds it in place. Kind of hard to get it on there. I probably could have used something like some bigger clamps but I wanted to try and keep it as minimal as possible. So another set of the wooden blocks down at the other end. I like to try to do a little bit of things symmetrical just so that they relate one end to the other. Um, not always, but I, I tend to try and do that so that there's, um, there, there's some sort of symmetry to things. Not exactly symmetry, but just about maybe balance rather than symmetry. And then just you know mixing it up. So I'm gonna do um, another thing. I <laughs> I don't know that I've ever seen this before, but I had these. This was plastic cutting mats that I had from leftover from a workshop, and so I cut those into sections and then wrapped those around sections of the fabric, and then use rubber bands to cinch them down and try to get it nice and tight. And so the so that. It might let a little bit more of the dye in than the um, than the wood blocks, but it it does work as a, it works as a resist like the other, and so that's that's it for now. And now it's time to get dyeing. And so this is the next day. You can see there's that glorious metallic sheen and the little cluster of foam on there that's called the flower. And I've heated the vat back up and it is ready to go. And I've set everything off to the side, taken it off the heat. And at first I thought I was going to use, with, the, with all the clamps, I was going to try and submerge them down with, and just with a, a hook and, and hope that they would sort of stay under, under the liquid. It needs to stay in the indigo for several minutes, for the, hopefully five to 10 minutes. And so I was hoping I could just drop it down into the into the vat and that would hold it but what ended up oh and also another thing is to keep the um, keep from water from dripping into it try to squeeze as much water out as possible and then 
really don't want to add any air to that vat, that perfectly balanced vat. But my little bit of finagling here just, it, it really wasn't working, so I just gave up on the idea of using the little hook and put the rubber gloves on and I'll just hold it in the, hold the, the fabric under the, the surface of the liquid for, I guess I ended up holding it for about five minutes. And this is going to require multiple dips. And so it just, so you just kind of sit there and I kind of massage the fabric um, as much as possible with all of the, uh, the clamps on there. And then again, being careful not to have any drips and to squeeze as much of the dye out and, and back into it with, oh, yeah, so I got a little bit of dips going on there, but then do a quick rinse. And this is just plain cool water and give it a good rinse. And then it needs to go hang on the line and oxidize. And it needs to hang on that line. It needs to, once the oxygen starts getting back to the, uh, to the fabric, it needs to do that for about 30 or 40 minutes. So this is not a fast process, it, it takes time. And I've, this, this little bundle here, this one's a little easier to, um, to squeeze out the liquid, uh, but it's, and it's gonna, it's gonna be a little easier to hold under. The other thing is that there's um, sort of a sludge on the bottom of the, of the pot, and so we don't want the, um, you don't want the fabric to come into, into touch with that. And there's Dave walking down to the mailbox. Everybody wave hi to Dave. <laughs> and so now it's it's time to take that one out. It was in there for probably five, six minutes. Give it a good rinse. And then off to the clothesline. And this is after multiple dips. So you can see it's getting later in the day. And these have each of these, I had four of the linen scarves and each one has dipped and been out to oxidize uh, three times. And so that's, you know, that's pretty much takes up most of the day getting all of these, um, the, the process. And after it's had plenty of time to oxidize, then I can start unwrapping all of my little little crazy things that I've I've tied these on here but it's it's almost I think it's harder when it's wet to get all the rubber bands and all of the those little bits of resist materials off of off of the scarves but it's a beautiful afternoon and the colors the fall colors still hanging in not much left but some And even when these are wet, it's, you know, you can sort of see what's going on, but you know, it really, you have to wait until they're dry. And then these haven't been fully rinsed or the dice uh, set yet. So I'll be doing a vinegar bath when all is said and done to, to counteract the lime. And last but not least, so this is the last of the linen scarves. And so, you know, we'll, I'll, it's, it's just gonna, I'm just gonna have to wait and see, see how it all looks. But look, you know, I think I've got a promising start here. But actually most of the, the colors from the botanical prints, most of that washed out in the details. So there's really not, there's some interesting markings and all, but there's really not much left of the botanical prints. And this is the next day, and you can see after I dyed the, the silk scarves, just how much different the color is. Dyeing the linen requires, you have to mordant the fabric, and it doesn't really like the botanical prints as much as the silk. And so what I ended up doing was just dyeing the linen again. So these scarves went into the vat another two or three times. But my heart really is in the silk right now because the, 
the patterns are just so extraordinary and the range of colors and I think that that's just what I'm going to keep doing for a bit until I learn more about how to properly mordant the, the linen. But it's, a, it's just an amazing thing. And I mean, oh my gosh, how could you not just think, oh, how could you not just love that until, oh my gosh, it's just an amazing thing. So that's it. That's the end of it for now. And we'll start again in the spring. <laughs>